Welcome to Teach Two Dumb Dudes. I'm Joe Bento with my co-host Rob Washburn. In this episode, we speak with Andrew Halam. Andrew is an author of the best-selling books Millionaire Teacher and Millionaire Expat. Andrew has seen tremendous success by investing in the stock market at a young age and now lives a location-independent life. His story is truly inspiring. Rob and I started out thinking we'd be talking all about finance, but Andrew's perspective on life is a true gem of this conversation. Every day following this conversation, I found myself thinking about the things Andrew has said regarding conventional success versus true happiness, the meaning of a fulfilling life, and the intricate balance that is needed to attain the latter. Recording already. Hey, Andrew. Hey, what's up, Andrew? How are you, How you doing? Here? Really good, welcome. very good, very excited to have you here. I have so many questions because I stink at finances. Yep, to <laughs> both of us. <laughs> All right, get ready to have your brain picked. This is good, Ben. <laughs> this is really good. Yeah, how are you? How are you? How are things? So, so are you are you based in Canada now, or nope? I'm based nowhere. So, as strange as that sounds, oh, I'm kind of lovely. It sounds well it depends right it depends so right now i'm in panama city and uh i guess since about 2014 my wife and i have been nomadic so we Ooh. met so i'm canadian and she's american okay and i took a like a year off i was a teaching in canada and i took a year off it was called a deferred salary leave which was this amazing thing that my school district offered where you know they could take 30 percent of your income up to a, a specific period of time or 20%, depending on the program that you hit. But I wanted to do this aggressive one. So I had them take 33% of my income. And at the end of three years, they give you a full year off and they give you the money back in monthly installments plus interest. Oh, wow. nice. And then they guarantee your job when you come back. So I just took that time and just traveled. I just wanted to see as much of the world as I could in a year. Hmm. And, then, uh, and then while I was in Morocco, I got this email from the principal of the school I was at in Canada. And he said to me, I just took this job at, uh, at Singapore American School. So it's an American curriculum, international school, 4,000 kids, K to 12. So it's the biggest international school in the world. Hmm. And he said, this, wow. is all, this is awesome. Why don't you consider not going back to Canada and coming here? And uh, there's a job and you could apply for it. And so I applied and then met my wife there. So she's, as I said, she's originally from Pennsylvania. So we were there. Um, she was there already when I met her. She, she was there three years. And then we stayed. I stayed a total of 12 years. And then I left in 2014. So what we decided to do, is wow. we, we thought we'd take a year off in 2014. We're like, let's take a year off. And then one year led to two, which led to three, which led to <laughs> seven. <laughs> and the train yeah. just kept rolling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're still going. We're, wow, that's so incredible. We're enjoying it. So, so right now, cool. We're, uh, we're going to, you know, we're in Panama City and we'll be here until January. Then we'll go into the mountains of Panama and we'll stay there. We'll go to some of the islands. There's some amazing uh, islands. And, and so we'll spend some time there. And then... Um, yeah, that brings us to April. And yeah, we've, we've got all these crazy plans. The nice thing wow. is, you know, if you, with today's day and age as well, like you don't need loads of money to be able to do this. You just need right. the ability to work online. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. And that's one of the really coolest things to be right about the world today is, you know, you can work from anywhere. I know, you know, when uh, COVID hit, so many people did transfer to uh, work from home situations. And now companies are starting to realize that, well, maybe we don't need to pay for these big, expensive offices. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and of course, oh. like, yeah. And if you can do that in your, in your hometown, um, you know, there's, there's a term called geographical arbitrage, which basically means, you know, you earn money in your home country. But if you happen to be living even just part of the year in a place like Mexico or Guatemala or, you know, Panama or whatever, mm -hmm. Thailand, you're, your money goes so much further. So you're, sure. you're kind of, you know, you're able then to save more money for the future and spend more money if that's what you want to. And when you spend more, I mean, spend more money, it feels like you're spending more money because you're just getting mm. so much more for your, for your money. Yeah. Sure. Your dollar stretches a lot further. What's yeah. your living situation like when you're, when you travel these places? It's so, it's so differs. Like, um, 
we do a lot of different <laughs> different things. So <laughs> in 2017, I mean, that's it. Like we're just totally addicted to variety. In 2017, we bought a, a Winnebago Travato. It's like a Mercedes Sprinter. Sure. Camera, right? mm. Yeah, yeah. And so our goal was to drive it down from a driver from Canada to the tip of Argentina. Wow. And so we started this, this journey and we had no time frame. I'm sure you know, what, what's the total mileage of that? I don't know. No? I don't know. And, and here's, why, <laughs> here's, here's why I don't care. Here's why I don't care. It, wasn't, it definitely wasn't like planned to be a linear route. So sure. like we zigzagged across the Western US hitting all the national parks. Right. Oh, you, didn't plug wow. in Google, you didn't plug in the Google Maps and take the easiest route. No, <laughs> no, no, no. All, all no, highway. <laughs> not at all, not at all. But we, you know, it was, it was really cool. When we got to, to Mexico, I, I've been to Mexico several times, but I hadn't really seen Mexico. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, we spent 10 months alone in Mexico, like driving into Mexico alone. It was, it was amazing. I never wow. anticipated being there that long, but you know, you ask me what it's like day to day. And, and the funny thing is that I get a lot of requests to do these speaking gigs around the world. And my wife does is when we get the requests, she'll organize it. She figures out that maybe there's a specific six week period that would work well for Europe. And so we get these requests for Europe and she sort of tries to schedule them in the specific six week mm. section. Mm-hmm. And then what we would do is we would park the van in wherever we happen to be like Mexico or Guatemala or El Salvador. And honestly, guys, like we'd fly off and we'd pray that it'd be there when we got back. <laughs> and was it ever not there you know i always expected that you know at some point i'd come back and at least i not have not have not so they'd be on blocks time. right yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah but it didn't you know every time it was good um, wow and we parked it some of the places look really really good like there's a particular place in ahihik mexico where it just had full-on 24-hour surveillance it was just like a state-of-the-art place to store and i felt we felt pretty good about that sure. and then there are these other ones where <laughs> it just looks so sketch oh, man. <laughs> oh sure it was like a car yard out of a horror movie or something <laughs> it, it, definitely 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 <laughs> one thing we really enjoyed though is is this contrast so you know we would do this with um you know we fly off to asia or we fly off to the middle east or to europe give a series of talks and then fly back. What was really cool was the contrast. Obviously, when we're driving around our camper van, we're meeting people who are pretty adventurous. Like they, you know, like families from say Argentina who are raising their kids in a motor home as they play music along the way. Mm, And they'll have like one, one family in particular was so interesting. They had, they had these advertisements plastered all over the side of their RV and they had these twin 10 year olds. And I asked them, as you always do, like, well, how are you doing this? Like everyone wants to know how the other yeah. person So if you're sure. traveling like from Argentina to Alaska and that's your plan, how are you doing this? How are you affording this? Right. And so with these guys, they were, ironically, they were actually by trade, they were circus performers. Oh, wow. <laughs> and wow. What they did was uh, they plastered all these ads on the side of their RV and they had these deals with these television networks in Argentina where they would take little recordings of what their experiences were as they were traveling. And then they would share those with, uh, with the TV and the radio stations. And of course, then because they've got, you know, they're high profile now and they're on television sure. for their whatever, it's probably like 15 minutes a week, but the advertisers would pay for you know that spot on <laughs> the spot on their wow. RV, so that's what fueled these guys in their journey. So I think, I think they were in that thing for two and a half years. But it hmm. was just this cool contrast where I'd be, we'd be, we'd be hanging out with say a family like that around a campfire in the mountains of Mexico, and talking about just really cool down to earth life sort of oriented stuff, important stuff, hmm. and then and then we'd fly off to. I'd be speaking in, say, I don't know, Facebook in Dubai or like a Madison Resort in Malta. And, you know, it was it was cool in its own way. But 
such a contrast as you, oh, you, know, yeah. you they take you out like the ceo takes you out for like a five-star meal and <laughs> you know they, they fly you there business class put you up in a five-star resort and then we go back to living in a van right? <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> i'm assuming that you know you've written these books because you've found a way to create money for yourself to to live that life um and it's it's interesting too because if you have that money available and you choose not to stay at the five-star resorts and you know eat the fancy dinners but instead you and your wife have chosen the rv in mexico <laughs> we get a lot of variety and you yeah. know it's a, it's a funny thing because i wrote this this book millionaire teacher which became really successful so i was this guy who from the age of 19, I started investing my money. So I met a guy, my, I didn't come from money. My family didn't have any money. Mm. Um, I was one of four kids. My dad was a mechanic and it was just like, uh, you know, if, if I needed anything at all, like a pair of shoes from the time I was 12 or 13 and I had a paper route, well, like I was responsible for, right. buying, them, for mm. buying them. Right. Um, but I ended up meeting this uh, mechanic who happened to be a self-made millionaire and just didn't make sense to me. Like, I was 19 and I was working at this bus depot and I meet this guy that all the other mechanics told me like, he's a self-made millionaire. And if he ever wants to talk to you about money, makes you listen. And so at some stage, you know, he started chatting with me and I, I was, I was listening. I was interested. right. And so it was fascinating because I started to, you know, compound interest as it, it truly does work. It's magic over time. So here I am adding money to my portfolio early on, you know, hundred bucks a month. And then over time, you know, as I earn more money, I'm able to add more money. So yeah, I ended up building a, a fairly for, especially relative to the income I earned a really big portfolio relative mm. to the income that I earned without taking major risks. It was just right. super diversified. So, but, but here's what I find so fascinating is that I, we haven't had to spend any of that. And so, you know, we've had this life where we've been traveling around. It's made me realize also that you can live really simply and you can follow these really cool dreams where like my wife and I spent quite a bit of time in Bali and, you know, we'd be going to the same restaurant as this other couple that we'd see pretty frequently. And then inevitably the questions start popping up. Like, so what are you doing here? And what do you, mm. what do you, what do you do? Right. How, how are you making this happen? And that's when I realized yeah. people don't need a lot of money. You know, it's all about you know, what you're choosing to do with the money that you have. Right. And, and often where you choose to be located, not always necessarily full-time, but part-time, like part of the year, spending time, you know, sacrificing your winters to spend part of the year in Thailand. <laughs> So that sounds that sounds terrible to have to sacrifice a Rhode Island winter. But <laughs> right. Let me tell you, doesn't it? When you started investing at nineteen, you say you just started off small, um, and that sounds good to me because I use a program called Stash. Um, they're fairly new, and you can buy pieces of a stock, right? So I can't go out and just slap down, you know, whatever it is right now, two thousand something dollars on a share of Amazon. Yeah. So I can invest fifty bucks for one or two into Amazon, and you know, I have like a small portfolio. I, I invested like a few hundred dollars in Lucid Motors. They just went public, I think, a few months ago, and it's supposed to be the next Tesla stock, hopefully. Um, did you have somebody help you decide which stocks to invest in? And you mentioned you didn't make yeah, any of that. What and did you, you invest in? Yeah, and you didn't said you didn't spend any of that money. So it was was it just dividends that you that you lived off of? No. So we're right now we're living off um, off writing income. So mm. I write. So I write like a, a weekly column for a, a U.S. based financial services company called Asset Builder. Mm -hmm. So that's regular gig. Uh, once a month, I write for the Globe and Mail, which is Canada's national newspaper. Uh, and the nice thing about the asset builder article that I write weekly is actually they've given me the rights to that. So I can sell that. Oh, so nice. I, so I sell that to a, a brokerage in Luxembourg called Swiss quote. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of get to double dip. And so just, uh -huh. just based on that, it's more than enough for us to, you know, to be able to live for the past, you know, how many years we've been on the road. So the, in terms of the actual investing, like, you know, I, I went the route that a lot of people do when they first start out. Like if you walk into a bank and they'll get you into actively managed mutual funds. Right. And so basically they're, you know, diversified products that are managed by a professional fund manager who buys and sells stocks internally, trying to give you the best returns for, you know, the given fund called the Joe fund or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so those 
particular funds end up having, of course, expense ratio costs associated with them. So any cost that's associated with paying salary of the analysts, uh, the internal trading fees, just the, the, the rent so on, the, on the building that the company happens to occupy, mm -hmm. they actually take that out of the fund. And so if you own the fund, they, they sift money out of it. It's called the expense ratio. So, you know, I learned that over time, the expense ratio costs can put a big dent in your future compounding growth. And so I started to buy individual stocks. And so I started to read as much as I could about Warren Buffett and how he picked stocks. Mm -hmm. And then not long afterwards, I started to blend in a, a strategy of purchasing index funds. Mm -hmm. And so with an index fund, it's just essentially when you purchase a, a U.S. stock market index, you're virtually buying every stock in the U.S. market, the good, the bad, the downright ugly, but you own it all at the lowest possible cost. And the thing that's interesting about that is often the stocks that are considered ugly end up rocking and the stocks often that are considered amazing will go right. through periods where they, they suck. Sure. And so what empirical evidence shows is that a portfolio of low cost index funds will over any 10 year period outperform about 90% of investment professionals, like professional traders after wow. fees. And so for me, it came to this point where I started thinking, hmm, well, I can be 90% of investment professionals after fees without doing any work, no research. Right. Just no fall, leaving no it in the fund. Yeah, and adding money to it every single month. And so, mm -hmm. now, so that's what you, I did. Do you consider that like, right, because it's an index, I mean, you're diversified across the entire market. So you, that's where, too, you would feel comfortable putting all of your investments within that index fund. Is that correct? Yeah. So in, in, the, in the States, the, the, the great thing is that you, you can purchase through Vanguard like a life strategy index yeah. fund which is everything in, involved within it. So you have like within that, you'll have a U.S. stock index and you'll have mm -hmm. an international stock index mm -hmm. and an emerging market stock market index. And there are different periods of times where like the emerging markets ends up beating the U.S. market quite substantially. Sure. And nobody ever knows when that time is going to be. It just kind of you know, starts to happen. Likewise, you know, European stocks might end up doing well. So the idea is that you own the whole basket so you don't have to bother with trying to trying to speculate and depending on the one that you purchase you can buy portfolio funds with different bond allocations so okay. if you're a high risk investor it could be 100 percent stocks mm -hmm. if you know you're a lower risk investor it might be 60 percent stocks and 40 percent bonds but it literally is a set it and forget it type of portfolio where mm -hmm. your money can come from your bank account automatically every month goes into an IRA with say Vanguard and it just Vanguard looks after the rebalancing of it. So once a year, or no, actually it's perpetually rebalanced so that it maintains that same target allocation. So if that allocation is hundred percent stocks, obviously it's hundred percent stocks. If it's 80% stocks and 20% bonds, it just makes sure that it maintains that allocation. So it's a, it's a way that on a risk adjusted basis, and this is an irrefutable academic premise on a risk adjusted basis, you will outperform 90% of professional managers. And the funny thing is that the 10% that do outperform you in a given time period aren't typically the same 10% who might outperform you during the next time period. So hmm. that's called interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's called reversion to the mean. So for me, guys, honestly, I do no research. Um, I haven't researched for years and I haven't had to. Cause I can just accept that I'll be 90% of the pros keep adding money. And I get on with things that are more important in life. Wow. Myself being 33 years old, wife, two kids house. I mean, how aggressive are you, you know, at that, or should I be right at the, this stage in my life in terms of putting money into investments or into savings versus spending on what we feel is, I don't know, valuable, I guess, or, or, or worthy of our time. I, I feel like that balance for me is really hard to strike. Yeah. 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 It's a, that's a really good question. Like how much you should you be putting away? One of the things that 
that I recommend people do is, first of all, track everything that you spend on an app. So you know, have an app on your phone, like a spending app. So it could be Mint or Good Budget. Yeah, I use or, Mint. I've been using it for years. Yeah, True Bell yeah. is another one. There's a bunch of them out there, yeah. What it actually ends up doing is we end up spending less as a result of tracking our expenses. So what some people will do is they'll say, well, it's okay. I don't need to do this because my credit card tabulates everything. But that's not the same thing because, mm-hmm. you know, if you're going to the store and you're, you know, you're purchasing whatever, um, a chocolate bar or your groceries or, you know, you're, you've gone out for dinner and you actually physically enter it. Like you physically enter it, you know, this was uh, dinner out pay this, including the tip, it takes 10 seconds, but you've, you've made yourself accountable to that by mm-hmm. physically doing it, physically putting it in. And in a way that accountability stops you from doing it too often, because you can, you can see your pie chart, you can see how much you're spending in each category, and you can start to weigh like your value system in terms of what are you actually getting out of it? Like, is it really enhancing your life satisfaction? And if the answer is yes, if you can say definitively, yeah, you know what, this regular expense that I make here, it enhances my life satisfaction big time, then keep doing that. Mm -hmm. But if it's something that you look at and you're like, you know what, that doesn't really enhance my life satisfaction that much. So I'll give an example of like, let's just say, okay, you like coffee. Mm -hmm. And here's one thing a lot of people do. So nothing against people like gourmet coffees for sure, but the best way to enjoy a gourmet coffee to buy it sit down with it right enjoy it sit with maybe some friends or just you or whatever but enjoy it but what a lot of people do is it becomes a habit where they'll pick up this gourmet coffee on the way to work yeah and they'll drive with it and you know you've paid tax associated with that and then you paid maybe a tip on that so whatever let's say it's six bucks including tax and tip. Mm-hmm. And when you're on your way to work, you, you're taking in the coffee, but you're not focused on the coffee at all. You're thinking about like, am I going to be late? Look at sure. that. traffic. Like, that, that jerk just cut me right. off. Um, well, it's you funny know. you pick coffee because we're up here in Rhode Island and oh there are so many Dunkin' Donuts up here it will blow your mind. I mean, if I don't know if you've ever been to Rhode Island. If you drive down the road and there's an off-ramp and, and an on-ramp for the highway, there's a Dunkin' Donuts on each side of the road in some areas in the state. <laughs> And I do the same thing every morning. I get a medium cold brew, $3.55. It is not gourmet. Are you really? <laughs> yeah. And I drink every it on day? the way to work every oh, day when God. I go to work. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny because in, in the book Balance um, that I wrote, I, I talked about this and I said, you know, if you're on your way to work, your head is somewhere else. Your head's not in your coffee. It, and let's say you spent, I think I used like $5.50 as an example for whatever Starbucks Mm -hmm. coffee. If you instead purchased, you know, if you instead made the coffee at home and you you brought it with you, as you're driving, you're, again, it's not a say, you're not savoring, it's coffee as you're driving. So you're not thinking about it so much. And the difference, it seems like a really small thing to spend, like that coffee might cost you 50 cents. And the difference between 50 cents and, you know, a difference between that and 550 is five bucks a day. And it doesn't sound like much, but over a working lifetime, sure. if, if it were invested, mm. if it were invested, we're actually talking about, we're talking about something in the region of about $800,000 to a million dollars. Wow. Oh. It's a, it's, so this is what we call a, a, a long-term offer. It makes me sad. Cost, right? <laughs> How many coffees have you bought? <laughs> oh, God. And you know, it's funny because, people might say, well, you know, let's, let, let's call it a half million dollars. Let's call it $500,000. They might say, well, okay, $500,000 is not going to have the same buying power 30 years from now that it has today anyway. So at whatever, that, that number is just, it looks impressive, but it's not. But if happening. you invest it, you get that interest. Well, that's how you sort of get the 500 grand, let's say is the actual, you know, 500 mm-hmm. grand to the mid to the million mm-hmm. is, you're, mm-hmm. you're exactly right. Is the investing of it. Um, but even then, when we look at it, we might say, well, okay, well, yeah, it's worth it to me because 500,000 or 800,000 or a million is not going to have the same purchasing power 30 years from now. But the truth is that the price of your cup of coffee is going to go up each year. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so the real reality isn't going to be a difference of, you know, I mean, if I'm using the example of 500,000, it's not going to be 500,000 
it's going to be more than that. So it's going to be equivalent sure. to, you know, this 500,000 in, in today's dollars. So right. if, if you're getting value out of it, that's fine. But coffee on the run, you're not getting value out of that. So you're mm-hmm. wasting massive amount of money, potentially sure. seven, seven figures down the road. And that's just coffee too. I think about when I go out for lunch at work, you know, now we're talking 10 to $13. So yeah, you know, yeah. it's like take coffee, you take lunch, take all the little stupid yeah, things those, that I buy over the course of whatever. Now we're talking, could be talking lunches. three, four million dollars, and that's definitely substantial for those work lunches that you just try to shovel down too before you get back. Like, there's no, yeah, it's not enjoyable. Man. Yeah, exactly. No, it's true. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, I'm also gonna, I'm also gonna assume you, you don't have debts, right? I mean, I, I assume living in that cycle of credit card debt that a lot of us are in, especially in America, will definitely burden you financially. I would assume too. Yeah, and that's a really good one to bring up. And in, in that, you know, if you owe money, one thing that I think is really important, and I'm talking about like high interest debt, so student loan debt, car loan debt, that sort of thing. Credit card. Mor- a, a mortgage is a credit card, definitely. Yeah. Mortgage, mortgage is low interest debt. So I'm not mm-hmm. necessarily talking about that. Sure. Most, people, most people will carry mortgages. But the idea that if you have what I'll call high interest debt, so that's debt that you know, might be charging you five, six percent plus, paying that off is a, every dollar really that you put towards paying that off, paying down that principal is equivalent to an after tax guaranteed return of whatever that interest rate is. So if it's six percent or in the case of credit card, it's equivalent to an after tax 18 percent return paying wow. that off. So the idea that if you have an outstanding debt on your credit card, don't invest any money know, pay off that credit card like that. and yeah, take, take that thing down. You, what you can do is, you know, Dave Ramsey talks about what he calls the debt snowball. And I kind of like, yeah, I love that method from Dave Ramsey. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. His idea is, you know, you have a series of debts and the idea is that you take the smallest one and you, you focus on it, you make the minimum payments and all the others, but you focus on the smallest debt and you attack it. And then when you take it down, it feels like a victory. Like you, mm. you've done it, you've cleared it. You're on your way to the next smallest debt. So then you attack that. The only exception to that rule where I say don't invest until you've taken out all of your high interest debts. The only exception is if you've got a, a corporate 401k and your company that you're working for is going to match you on mm-hmm. a contribution to your investments, right. absolutely take advantage of that because that could be a match is literally it's a 100% gain on the money. Free money. Free, free money. Free, yeah. Free money. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I, I've, I've read things say like, if you have any kind of savings in the bank, you should just take that money and pay off your credit cards. There's no sense in having money in the bank, but you're still accruing interest every month on a credit card that you're paying, you know, the minimum payment or maybe a little more than a minimum payment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I do like the idea of having some kind of emergency fund. The and nest then, egg, right? Yeah, sure. or at least the, so I guess with nest egg, I guess we usually think about the retirement pod at the end. So yeah. The were, but then there's something else where you have this, like a, a financial cushion where, and generally speaking, there's a, a general rule of thumb suggesting that it's a good idea to have, say, three to six months worth of living expenses that's readily available in in cash in some kind of cash form. And so it could be I like, wish Andrew. Yeah, I know <laughs> right. it. I know it. My I know goodness. it. I know it. Um, and of course, this is like basic needs, right? Like this would be, say, take three months worth of living expenses that you would just be, you just be sucking everything in, right? I mean, this would be, you could, you could, the bare you could, bones, you yeah. could survive, like sure. you could, you could feed yourself, you could pay your rent or your mortgage, but you could, you could just survive on it. But the idea of having that is pretty important. And I think it was accentuated, of course, by a lot of people kind of started ignoring that, like, ah, yeah, whatever. Then the pandemic hits and all of a sudden loads of people aren't going to work. Right. And so it was just, it kind of hit home there. Hmm. Uh, in terms of the markets in general with the pandemic, uh, it seems like the, the market has fluctuated so much from, you know, where it took off and, you know, we were reading about every stock was at all times highs and, and now it's come back down. I mean, it seems that uh, with your approach, that doesn't worry you one bit. 
I remember I remember day, days when my father would call me up and be like, oh, it's a bad day today. I lost 15 percent or, or something crazy yeah. like that. Um, but so with the strategy of index only, is that something that you truly don't worry about or uh, is that, you know, a, a point to move things or, or how do you usually handle those? The secret is not to worry about what level the markets are at or your account is at at all. So I'll give you a, an example here of Fidelity, the big mutual fund company did a study mm -hmm. and they wanted to see over a lengthy period of time, who are our best investors? Are they people who, of a certain age demographic, um, male, female, uh, mm -hmm. people with business degrees and economics degrees? Are they people moving money around? Like really looking at the economy in and out of specific funds, finger on the pulse of where the markets are going and interest rates and maybe elections. And what they found was fascinating. They found that their best investors on a percentage basis, so people that earned the, the, the old best overall gains on portfolios over, over lengthy periods of time, were people that had actually forgotten that they even had accounts with Fidelity. Because <laughs> they're not taking money out, moving it around, right? Yep. It's, just, it's just compounding interest. Yeah. So, so when the stock know, market goes down, if you don't notice it, it goes right back up and whatever it takes six months, a year, wow. even a couple of years. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's it's, so, so I have an analogy <laughs> that your investment portfolio is a lot like a bar of soap. I mean, like the more you mess with it in the shower, the smaller it gets. Right, <laughs> right. Sure. right, right. That happened to me. I um, smokes. Right before I started getting this little investing that I've been doing, um, what got me into it was the whole GameStop thing. I put, a, I put like a couple hundred bucks in GameStop. I was like, here we go getting rich. This is my time. And then it started to dip. It dipped down a lot. And I was like, oh crap, I got to get out. So I took it out. I lost, you know, whatever it was like 15, 20%. And then two months later, it skyrockets again. And if I just would have kept it in there. So I was like, all right, I can't play this like short game. Like I need to put money into something and I just need to hold it there and just let it do what it's going to do. Cause I was, I was just getting too freaked out by it. Yeah. It, it's a funny thing. Cause if you, if you do have a diversified portfolio, the nice thing about that if you have an individual stock, a company can always go bankrupt. Like a company can always, the stock can always drop and just stay down for years as well. Mm -hmm. So you can just end up picking a dud and it might be an awesome business. So Pfizer, for example, was one of the most popular stocks in the world in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. It was so popular. I mean, they had Viagra, um, they had Lipitor. I mean, they were just like a total can't miss business. But the share price had risen so high relative to business earnings. And business earnings are rising too. But the share price had risen so much faster than the business earnings that eventually there's a reckoning. And so even though Pfizer was earning record levels of revenue, after the year 2000, the stock dropped. And 10 years later, it still hadn't earned a profit. Actually, mm. I think with Pfizer, I think it was actually more like 14 years wow. later. Wow. 14, it hadn't earned a profit. And so... It's just one of those things too, where if you are fully diversified, so you've got you know, exposure to the entire world's markets, you don't necessarily have to worry about say an individual company going, let's say bankrupt. And then that's mm -hmm. you know, the ultimate, that's the real kick to the groin. Um, you just own everything. And when things drop for me personally, and I think this would be the same case for you guys, is that we should actually celebrate when the markets drop. So it's irrelevant what our portfolio is actually worth today and it's irrelevant what it's worth tomorrow what's most important is what's it going to be worth 25 30 35 years from now when you actually sure. make this money and right so when the portfolio or when the markets drop all of this means is that when you're adding regular sums to your portfolio you're now buying the same stuff at a discount right hmm. right as long as you're making that continued investment technically over yeah. time you will win because you're buying it at short exactly. prices Exactly. And as you get closer to that age, so when I'm ready to retire, I need my money. I can always move those high risk dollars into bonds, right? And into medium and low risk so that if something does happen, because if I'm 65, I wouldn't want to see a huge drop right. in the market if I'm ready to retire. I'd want to be a little more stable and know that that money's going to be there. Yeah, that's why those uh, Vanguard target retirement funds are really good. Mm -hmm. So what, what Vanguard will do with those is it's a fully diversified portfolio of stock and bond market indexes. And over time, as you get closer to your retirement, it shifts and increases the allocation to bonds. So it becomes a little bit more conservative as you get older. And again, 
you don't have to do anything. Just you have the set amount that's coming out of your bank account every month mm-hmm. um, and just goes in and, and Vanguard rebalances the, the holdings for you. Hmm. How do you feel about uh, cryptocurrencies? Are you familiar with those at all? Yeah, I am familiar with them. For me, it's a speculation rather than an investment. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I would suggest not to put anything into it that you can afford to lose. I think that would be my general rule of thumb because it doesn't, I'm, I'm, I'm in line a little bit with Warren Buffett on this one. It, it doesn't produce anything. Mm. Uh, it, can't, it can't reproduce. So when, right. its, value, when its value increases, um, you're only hoping that you can sell it to somebody else later down the road. It, it's business earnings aren't actually rising. So there's no internal business earnings that are rising. Unlike markets or unlike corporations or unlike real estate right. where the business earnings or the rental revenue increases mm-hmm. over time. There's like actual tangible value there. Yeah. yeah. So. And you know, there are, there, I think there are like more than 600 cryptocurrencies out there now. Yeah, that's a lot. And, and I think it's going to be a really big, ugly bubble that, that eventually for a lot of people is going to burst and, and people are going to get hurt with it. So hmm. of course, when do, you, when do you think this would happen? I can't see the future. I don't yeah. know. And, but I, but I do strongly feel that um, not to invest anything in that you can't afford to lose. Hmm. It makes a lot of sense. I, I think it's something that we, we hear common with the cryptocurrency stuff. So in your book, the, the millionaire teacher, you mentioned a little bit about robo advisors. Yeah. And so this is something that I only recently have heard about and simply I kind of always thought it was like the same thing if you bought like an index fund or, 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 or um, was it an ETF? Like it's just a managed account almost. Are robo advisors similar to that or? Yeah, they are. What they, when, when robo advisors came into being, which was around 2007, I think mm-hmm. that was around the first time you started seeing them in the US. There were so many people then that were paying they're paying far more than they needed to with like their firms like Raymond James or Wells Fargo. They'd have an advisor who would put them into actively managed mutual funds. And so what robo advisory firms said was, you know what, people are going to get smart to this and they're going to figure out that a portfolio of index funds is really the best way to go. And they're not going to necessarily know how to do it. Like they won't know where to purchase it or how to purchase Mm. it. So they came with the idea up with the idea that why don't we make this really easy for people and all they need to do is fill out a risk assessment sheet we you know often you can talk to somebody right. and they'll sort out what your tolerance for risk is you have a series of questions they'll build you a portfolio of etfs that much like vanguard's target retirement fund or vanguard's life strategy funds are complete portfolios they'll rebalance them for you and all you do is automatically send the money. So it costs a little bit more to mm-hmm. do that than it does to go directly through Vanguard. Yeah. So directly through Vanguard is cheaper. But on the flip side, with a lot of robo-advisors today, it's pretty easy to receive some sort of financial planning advice. Right. So with Vanguard, you can do that. But generally speaking, you need quite a bit more money for the for it to be able to access that for free. Otherwise, right. they charge you for it. Right. And so, re- and so really, so is that the biggest advantage of the robo-advisors is the free education? Yeah, they'll help you. And they'll be like a gatekeeper. And I think mm. that's probably the, the best thing. So if the market collapses and you're doing it on your own with Vanguard, you can just open your account. You can sell everything. And that's a risk. We, we don't want to, want to do that. We don't want to be right. selling on if you're doing it with a robo advisor firm, you actually have to speak to the gatekeeper and they'll, oh, you know, okay. <laughs> they'll, they'll talk you away from the cliff. Mm. They'll try to say, okay, look, market drops <laughs> are, are a part of the game. They're actually good for you because you think of yourself as a collector. You are a collector. Don't get distracted by forecasts. Don't get distracted by the fact that markets have dropped and that your portfolio has dropped. You're more interested in 30 years down the road, having as much money as possible. And so you're actually collecting those entities at lower prices now. So they'll be there to kind of coach you along the way. Mm -hmm. So in terms of these strategies, obviously it's a long-term strategy to grow long-term wealth. But how have you been able to turn these strategies into living the lifestyle that you want to live now? 
I think what it's done is just for me personally is, so I did build a portfolio that was large enough such that I could live on it. So mm-hmm. I could live on that, but I still have an income. I haven't really touched that. Mm-hmm. But what I think it's done for me is just in a way, it's given me some confidence knowing that I have a really nice, I have a really nice reserve there in case something doesn't go right with my freelance work. I can't write these stories anymore. And I'm on some beach in Guatemala and going, well, I, you know, my resume looks like crap because I haven't worked for eight years. So <laughs> it might be hard to hire, you know, it might be uh, hard for me to get like a teaching job. So if sure. I, want to teaching. So I think that's, it. it's just kind of giving me that extra, extra level of security. It was it that portfolio that made you write the book to get the speaking jobs and to get the smaller article writing that you do? Yeah, I think that really helped. Like, I mean, I was, I was writing before that, like I had such an interest in learning this stuff. And mm-hmm. by the time I was early thirties, I, I'd, I'd read about 400 finance books by that stage. Wow. I was just crazy into it, really, really into it. And so I started writing for magazines long before I, I wrote the book millionaire teacher mm-hmm. um, long before I, you know, I built a million dollar portfolio. So I just basically, you know, kind of continued doing that. Hmm. And do you have any children? We don't have children. We married no. late. Uh, okay. Do, do you want one? Yeah, we did. We gave mm-hmm. it a try. No, I mean, you, I mean, you can adopt me. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> do we want one? That's terrific. <laughs> child. <clears throat> yeah, I'll be, I'll be your man, child. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's terrific. So do you come with kids. I mean, you're, yeah. you're your right. wife says you're a man child, Rob. Yeah, exactly. I'm halfway there. <laughs> I'm, I'm the third kid. You know, you get I mean? the credentials. I'm the third child around here. So, um, no, this is all really excellent, excellent, excellent stuff. Um, so, talk to us about the new book, Balance. Right? How it was at January 2022. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited by that. So, or about that book. It's um, you know, and I guess based on what we were talking about in the very beginning. Sure was when I was giving these financial talks and I'd be let me you know asked to speak at a corporation and a lot of the people around me would be what you'd call conventionally successful and I that started rubbing me the wrong way like the idea of someone being a success because they had money um to me didn't seem to make much sense sure some, some would say oh see that woman over there she's she's a lawyer uh she's got her own law firm and she's got I mentioned on the hill, she's, she's a success. And I'd start thinking, okay, well, do you want to be successful? And you start asking people that question and everyone says, yeah, yeah, I want to be a success. And you go around and ask, do you want to be successful? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah who says no? So, Not to me and people like, no, I'll just live in this gutter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then when you ask why, so why do you want to be successful? Ultimately, when you keep asking that, people will say it's about life satisfaction. Oh, I want to be happy. I want to be, I want to have security and why do you want security? Well, it'll make me feel good. It'll give me life satisfaction. Basically make me happy. And so I looked at just this fascinating part where I thought, you know, we got it all wrong here. We got it kind of backwards. What we need to do is if life satisfaction is the goal, then we're truly successful when we have life satisfaction. Mm-hmm. So how do we get life satisfaction? We don't actually get life satisfaction by building necessarily a million dollar portfolio or necessarily having a $300,000 a year job or driving a Ferrari. Sure. That's not what boosts life satisfaction. So I looked at life satisfaction as kind of like a four legged table. Mm. Um, And the reason is that, you know, I would meet these people who were by financial measurements successful, but for whatever reason, I didn't deem them as a success because their life satisfaction was low because either their relationships were in a wreck. They weren't, they weren't looking after themselves. Mm, Super high pressure jobs, stress out all the time. Yeah. They weren't. I find that, I find that balance so interesting, right? You find that the people who, right. Are, you know, quote unquote, the way you phrase it successful, right. The, the traditional success, um, they work so many hours a week, minimal time for family. Like I view those people and I think like, how 
could anyone want to live like that? I mean, of course, there's something out there for everyone. But I think about <laughs> it personally, and it's like, I would be so miserable. Right. Look at yeah. the suicide rate for people that win the Powerball. It's it's astonishing the amount of people that you know commit suicide after winning like a large amount of money through the lottery. It just doesn't always equate to happiness. In the book Balance, what I did was I referenced this uh, Purdue University-based study where they looked at happiness relative to income, mm. and they they looked at it uh, and they measured I think 132 different countries on this assessment, mm. and and happiness increases with income to a point. And, and one of the reasons, I mean, it does make sense. So, you know, if sure. I've got a, if I got, if I've got a leaking roof, right. Uh, yeah. I need a little bit of money to fix it. And I'm going to be happier because me and my family, we're going to be dry, right? right. Um, food in the belly and a little bit extra for entertainment. Like that's what we want. And so in the, in the U S for example, the research suggests that life satisfaction ends up rising up to about a level of about 105,000 a year. So mm. household income. Mm-hmm. And then what it shows is it, it plateaus, rides along a flat bit. And then after about 160 grand a year, it actually declines. Mm. The theory on this is that just exactly as you're saying, where these people typically end up working a lot harder than the average person. And they spend less time with their families. They often sleep less. They have more stress. And as a result of that, there's a dip in life satisfaction. And it wasn't just the United States. This study was, it was consistently showing much the same thing across 132 different countries. Wow. And so independent on the, the, the country that you're actually living in too, where sometimes it was, it was a lot less. It wasn't like you know, everybody had to earn 160,000 mm. hit that downward slope. Like in countries like Thailand or Mexico, it was it was a lot lower in terms sure. of yeah you know, it's comparable to the economy in that country right it, ex- exactly yeah so you know i looked at success to be success you got to be maximizing your true life satisfaction which which i saw as a four-legged table so one was you need enough money yeah you need enough money um you don't have to have gazillions of dollars but you need enough to sustain yourself and at least have like a little bit left over for some fun um you need your health like you need to be able to do what you can to live a healthy lifestyle. I've got a friend who's a, a partial quadriplegic mm. and, and I would still consider him a success based on my measurement of health because he does what he can do. So partial mm. quad means that like he can move, he was in a bicycle accident. He can move his body. I think one arm he can't move and he can move his, his other oh. arm and he can kind of sh- shuffle along, mm. but you know, he does things to move. But he does things to like this con- constant rehabilitation type. Yeah. Sure. Otherwise, yeah. he would, otherwise he'd oh, be, it was not painful. The, the third element on, the, on this table or this third leg of this table is relationships. <laughs> so the relationships with your friends, with your family, um, they've got to be solid. Like you cannot be a success if your relationships are crap right you just can't you're you're just not going to be happy uh and then the fourth component was the the sense of purpose what what the japanese call ikigai like it's a reason to get up in the morning so for example you have the example of the lottery winner well usually what they do is they quit their jobs Mm -hmm. they spend a gazillion dollars they spend they're out there blowing their money around um they have no purpose there's no reason. Eventually, there's no reason for them to get out of bed. Right. Super they fun get, at first. <laughs> yeah, they get bored of spending that money, I guess. Right. Huh? Yeah, and then the people around them, you know, end up, you get a lot of tag-alongs. Mm. And so these aren't people that love you. These are people that love your money. And so then you've got this really shallow sense of like your relationships, your sense of relationships. You start to realize how shallow it is. And people take advantage of you it's not an enviable position to be in, which is why you're right. You know, levels of depression can be high with people who ended up, end up uh, winning the lottery. Mm. It's, it's unbelievable. And so your book balance here, we'll have to read it. And uh, you're going to teach us how to work on those four legs. Yeah, I do my best with that. I, I like the just digging into the behavioral based research in the book because it's, it's not intuitive. Yeah. You know, not intuitive. Um, you know, there's a cool study that it's, it's been going for on for eight decades now. It's called the, the Harvard study of adult development. Hmm. And it, they started it like 
over 80 years ago. And they were looking at following these people over their lifetimes. Um, and they wanted to see, well, what makes people happy? Like, what is it that actually jazzes people? And, and they all, as you guys can imagine, some were financially successful, others mm -hmm. weren't. Some got started off really well and then their life went off the rails. Others went off the rails early and got their life back on track. And they ended up studying them and then a series of inner city Boston kids. And then mm -hmm. they started studying all their families. Mm -hmm. And so they used to give them surveys and then they yep. would give their, their family surveys. So, you know, we can ask, like, you can ask Joe, like how Joe feels, but it's cool to also ask Joe's family, like, Hey, how does Joe respond to situation ABC? <laughs> so you get a, you get a bigger sense there of, so it's not just Joe and Joe's perception. It's like everyone around you. Plus sure. You. And now recently what they've been doing is, I mean, obviously as, as medical science has improved, they put these people into MRI scanners. Wow. So really testing them. And what they've found is that the happiest people are those that have the best relationship. It has nothing to do with money. Mm -hmm. It's not to do with money, even genetics to the point where, yeah, okay, genetics to a point, but the, the most important variable there was and is the relationship so if we're going to set goals you know obviously people go out and they set physical goals and they set educational goals and they set career goals but how many of us actually say i'm going to set interpersonal goals i'm going to set social goals here like i'm, I'm putting up that first like that's mm. first that's first yeah i don't think i do that very often at all in fact because we get wrapped up right we get right life so it's just not how i think about it either like you said i'm so wrapped up in in the kids and and work and and you know my wife and i right. get groceries and i gotta do this and i gotta do right. that fixing and, the house and all yeah stuff. fixing the house you know yeah. gotta clean the garage whatever and, and so yeah it is interesting because i it, it's funny my, my wife makes fun of me all the time because uh she I sure does i personally just don't have a uh real interest in going to make new friends around my area like my circle right and uh and so I, I don't think there's ever a moment though where i'm like i'm gonna set a new social goal <laughs> like i don't think i've ever said that ever <laughs> and, and so how would i even do that well i don't think you necessarily need more friends I, and that's you know that could be a misnomer as well <laughs> sure you, you but you you say i'm gonna do something cool and different with some of the friends i've got yeah so, rob that could be something where, you know, yeah, it's right. You, you treat Joe to something, right? Yeah. <laughs> God, Andrew, you are the best guest we have yeah, had on so far. <laughs> um, this podcast, I guess, is a good example of that. You know, we, Joe and I have been debating this around for the number of years now, and then finally we were able to put something together. So uh, I guess that, I guess there, that's one we've done, Joe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Enjoyable. That, that has a definite impact because what you guys are doing is you guys are creating memories. And oh, yeah. so, and you, when we look at life satisfaction again, and we, let's look at spending money, for example. Mm -hmm. When you spend money on stuff like the latest iPhone, you're not really creating a memory. You're just, you're purchasing something that you're going to get used to very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then it just becomes another phone. So there's no memory associated with that. So, so true. I, I look at the campfire analogy where 20 years from now, are you guys going to be sitting around a campfire talking about the iPhone that you bought in 2022 or some stupid fun thing that you guys did together or this crazy podcast mm. that you guys ran together or this guest mm. that you had? Like it's memories that we nurture because they are part of our identities. They're part of who we are. Wow. Steep. Oh. But I, I love my 75 inch 4K TV, Andrew. Like, <laughs> I, I love it like my child. I, see, and, and again, this is where we go back to it's so hard to strike that balance, right? Because I, really I totally is. hear you, right? And, and I love those memories. And, and I definitely agree with you that that's what I hold on to, you know, nearest and dearest. But like Joe said, I also love buying fucking dumb shit like video games and, <laughs> you know, like, like, I, like breaking those habits. And like you said, the, the act of actually typing in the expenses that you spend like I got, i'm gonna start yeah. doing that because I, I think that could be a, a big because right now the app i use now it just all auto loads in from the bank account yeah so it's yeah. real easy to ignore it 
Well, that's how Mint does it too. But Mint, you can like set budgets with it. So I get alerted when I spend too much money on like Dunkin' Donuts. So it's like, oh, you spent this much already. Here's your budget. It's like, whoa, it's only, you know, halfway through the month. So it kind of keeps you alert to like what you're spending. And it does help you say, all right, well, that's enough of that this month. And I won't, I won't touch that anymore, you know? Do you think that's the same, Andrew? Well, I think it could be. I'm the last guy who says that you got to live like a monk. <laughs> I'm not, I, th- that's no fun and, and here's the reason for that too you know you get this this notion that you've got to you know some people will say it's all about tomorrow at some stage you're going to be happier tomorrow if you just sock away your money and you're it's not my father happy. father's classic portuguese born he was born <laughs> there he came here and he was 12 and him and my grandparents just stuffed their money under the mattress <laughs> well, i mean the thing about that is that there are things you can do with money that are pleasurable and, and a lot of those things, you know, we talked about the experiences, things that'll build mm. memories, mm. like things that you guys do, things you do with your family and you, know, you take your kids on a trip, Oh yeah. go off with your friends, those things you're going to remember. And the stories get better every year, right? <laughs> right. unlike something that you purchase, which, you know, the memory fades and you're not going to mm. be talking about that 20 years from now around a campfire. Um, but it's one of those things where I think. Life, as I, I describe this in the book, Balance, too, I say life is like this dark hourglass and, and you can't tell how much sand you have left. And so mm. it gets tipped at birth. And, and anyone that socks away everything for some point in the future is a fool because you might not last this week. I mean, that's just reality. It sounds more right. Like, no, no, you're right. You're right. right. Anything could happen. So you, you kind of have to have an eye on today and an eye on tomorrow. It's crazy not to have an eye on tomorrow and mm-hmm. just live la vida loca. Because it's equally crazy just to live for some point in the future, talking sure. money away. And it's like, wait a second, there are things that I can do with this money that will actually enhance my life satisfaction. Mm-hmm. It's about identifying those things, like you said, of what brings you actual true value versus right. the new iPhone. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then the tricky part is, and here's where it is quite difficult, is we often don't know what those things are. So there's a, yeah. a behavioral economist named Daniel Kahneman. And what he did was he identified two types of what he called happiness. One was reflective happiness and the other was experiential happiness. So I'll give you an example. Somebody has a BMW. You ask them, do you prefer that BMW to driving like a Honda Civic? They will most certainly say absolutely yes. That's what mm-hmm. we call oh yeah. That's what we call reflective happiness however michigan state university did a really cool study where they asked people to rate like on a daily basis they asked them all kinds of questions it was a long ongoing study but they would ask them to actually rate how much they enjoyed their last drive so their drive to the university or the last time they drove the vehicle they would actually ask them to rate it and what they found was that the satisfaction they got out of driving their vehicles had nothing to do with the vehicle they had. So they could have a Mercedes sports car. And generally speaking, the people with the Mercedes sports car felt no more satisfaction driving or didn't get any more of a, a better feel or a thrill driving in their last drive than say the people who had you know, 10 year old Toyota Tercels. And, and the reason wow. is it's based on this hedonic adaptability. And that's what we call experiential happiness. And it's because we get used to the stuff that we own so Mm. at first when you first test drive a a brand new car a bmw Mm. you feel the acceleration you feel oh yeah it's exciting right and it's all you're thinking about when you're testing you're just like this car is so cool (laughs) and then and then later down the road and it's not that long you're driving and you're in traffic you're thinking about your day you're thinking about you know something your wife said that annoyed you whatever your your head isn't isn't in the in the moment of experiencing and enjoying what it is that your car has to offer so you know here's an example where uh, based on the research um based on life satisfaction not such a great idea to blow a ton of money on a on a vehicle for most Mm -hmm. people right it's a depreciating asset that too right second you drive it off the lot if you turn around and bring it back you're going to get less money than what you paid for it yeah (laughs) i mean it's a good point though because you know and it's been said for so long right the the materialism doesn't bring happiness Mm. um and and i think that that's you know unfortunately and especially in american society is 
yeah. still not the the norm, right? I, I mean, mm-hmm. God, even people within my own family, as soon as that new iPhone, iPad drops, uh, you know, they're ditching the old one and going to get it, right? It's always about that, the latest and greatest. Right, um, right, right. We always rate people by monetary and what kind of car they drive, how big their house is, just how like America is. Right. And yeah. so with those type of like societal pressures, when you're writing a book like Balance and telling people, well, it's not really about the car. It's not really about what you're spending on or what your status is. You know, what, what kind of pushback have you gotten for, for some of these ideas? I think, I think it's, it's interesting because what we, we spend more money on stuff than we ever did in the past. Mm-hmm. And so we've normalized it. And so you, be, you have to think a little bit differently. I say you can afford anything, but not everything. Mm-hmm. And so the idea is that, you know, if it really truly has to be the expensive car for you and that you've got to go for that, if that's your thing, then you've got to be ruthless about cutting back in these other areas. Some mm. other areas, you got to find, and find a place to cut back. You guys would laugh. Um, so, so we have an investment account that's worth several million dollars. And, and my car costs $4,500. <laughs> and that's, that's what I drive. It doesn't have rust in it. Like, uh, yeah. you know, I, yeah, I don't, right. I, don't it, it, I keep good care of it. I keep it's it reliable, driving. right? Reliable. It's garage capped because I know that and research suggests that I'm not going to get any more out of driving around in a, in a BMW and I could afford that. Right. But the hedonic adaptability being what it is, it doesn't make any sense. Now on the flip mm. side, we have this Winnebago Travato van, which is, you know, it's almost as expensive as class B vans get. So it's got right, the sunroof right. and it has the, you know, obviously it's got the microwave and it has the, <laughs> all um, the bells and whistles. The, yeah. The, the, sure. the electric awning. I mean, it's, when I said sunroof, I meant like solar panels on the roof. It's got, oh, wow. You know, wow. It's got an inverter and it's got a shower. It's got a bathroom and a shower. I mean, it's full, <laughs> it's full on. And these things are stupidly expensive. Oh, yeah. However, for me, with this thing, I'm not, I'm not mechanically inclined. And if I want to have a good experience driving down to Argentina, I've got to try to put the best odds in my favor. And so for mm-hmm. me, they're not going to be driving in a Volkswagen van that will sure. come down several times. Yeah, right. So and the places that you're going, I mean, some of them are obviously dangerous too. So you wouldn't want to be broken down on the side of the road exactly. or, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> like you so, said, sometimes you came back, you would, wouldn't even know if the van was going to be there. <laughs> it's true. Exactly. So I'm not cheap, but I'm careful and make purchases based on the value system. So, you know, another example is we are generous and when we give to others. Mm. And I talk about this in the book Balance. Research suggests this boosts our life satisfaction tremendously, giving our time, giving our efforts, giving, you know. Like adopting, adopting an older man as your son. Hey, yeah, that's exactly it. If I took you on, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would make me feel great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would that make feel great? <laughs> um, and it's an interesting point, too, you bring up the giving I am working in the travel industry, right? And we do uh, guided tours all over the world. Um, we had a, a speaker come in who was a behavioral psychologist and, and was talking about memories and how do people remember vacations? Mm. And we installed a program on our vacations to arrange a circumstance in which you would give back. And so, for instance, we send people to Israel and there there is a a coffee shop who is run by um, women who have been uh, victims of, of, you know, domestic abuse or heinous acts or or any of those types of things. Um, And all of our guests would leave that specific trip and be floored by the memory. And that giving back, because, you know, all of the money you spent at that cafe goes direct to helping these women. Um, and uh, everyone, always, that memory stuck so much. But when we tell people, like, yeah, you're going to go have dinner on the Eiffel Tower in Paris, what do they do? They complain that the dinner was too late. Interesting. It's- you know? And, yeah. and, so, and so it's one of those things where, you know, I mean, I've had dinner in the Eiffel Tower and, and it's freaking amazing. 
like absolutely unbelievable. But comparatively, it's just not remember the same because you bring up the point of everybody's value system it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah, it is. But when you're but when you're going to buy those vacations, why is why are people's instincts? Well, I'm going to buy the dinner in Eiffel Tower. I don't right. care about. Well, it's just just like the test drive you mentioned when you're in the BMW and you're like, wow, this is so cool. You're looking at the vacation like, wow, dinner on the Eiffel Tower. And then, you know, you just become your miserable self anyways and complain that it's too late. It's <laughs> so like... th- this comes back to what Daniel Kahneman talked about, the brave behavioral economist. We actually don't know what will make us happy. Mm. So, you know, you could even ask somebody, hey, do you want to spend this time having dinner on the Eiffel Tower or do you want to spend your time here at this cafe in Israel where all this money goes towards like helping children? And if, if they're not really on the spot and, you know, put in a moral position, they're meant mm-hmm. to like, take a box. So yeah. judge them. You know, most people are going to think they're going to get more out of that mm-hmm. Eiffel Tower thing. Like we honestly don't know what makes us happy. So the behavioral studies, the research that I, that I dig up for this book, Balance, to me is so interesting because I get to look at it and go, okay, this is what the research suggests. So if I want to get the most out of my life, I got to try and put some of this behavioral research in my corner so that I can end up, you know, living the best life that I can and and giving it's interesting because it affects us on a cellular level. Mm. That to me is Mm. incredible. Lowers blood pressure, makes us happy, creates memories. And, and you'll talk about, that experience more than like several years from now, it will find its way into a campfire story. Mm. We've we've done the same where my wife and I have contributed money and helped people build houses in Cambodia. And we we helped build wells and we saw where the, where our money was going. So it's what we we call pro-social giving. And we were there on the ground in Cambodia. I'll tell you guys, like I talk about that stuff. I talk about the experience we had there because it becomes, it becomes, so impactful and that's exactly Mm. what that's exactly what you're talking about right yeah i'm not sure if you listened to our previous episodes but um two episodes ago we had a guy called uh john here's on and he runs the first things foundation and he actually takes volunteers and puts them in places like guatemala sierra leone and they live in that area for two years so that they can really find out what the community needs as far as help goes as opposed to just like you said, coming down and building a school and then leaving and saying, this is great. See you later. Um, and I thought it was amazing that somebody would give their life up like that for two years to go, like John said, live in a mud hut with malaria. But after the podcast was over, you kind of get this sense that, 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 yeah, like John really feels good about what he did because he's, he made those changes that are going to, you know, carry over generations for those people, even in the smallest way. Oh yeah. It's, it's, you know, what, what he did is well, you know, what we call pro-social giving. Mm-hmm. If you give money to the United Way, you might feel pretty good about that, but mm-hmm. really, you don't see where it's going. You don't see the impact. You don't make connections with the people. Right. He, he actually made connections with the community in the process as well. So his, his gifts of his resources and his time ended up coming back to him tenfold. Mm-hmm. And that's it, like giving, I think, I feel like giving your time to something is far more valuable than just giving money. Yeah, it's huge because in giving that time, especially when, when, we, when we look at life satisfaction again, it's about relationships. Now you're blending, helping, and you're building relationships with these people. Mm. Um, and so that's, that's just huge. You're giving and building relationships. And so this, is a, this is a huge component of, uh, of augmenting your life satisfaction. Mm. Mm. So, so obviously, right, even just over the course of this podcast, we went from talking about your first book, Millionaire Teacher, to now this book, Balance. What led you to that transition, right? I mean, from a financially focused book to maybe something that's a little more behavioral and, and psychology based. Mm-hmm. Is it just based off of your own interest and what you've kind of fallen into throughout the years? Or what, what led you to kind of shift gears a little bit in these books? Seems very holistic. Yeah, it's funny because I have people, people that didn't know me well. So they... Yeah. They, they would say to me things like, oh, well, you know, you're really like personal finance. You wrote this book, Millionaire Teacher, and you talk about money. And I'd say, no, dude, no, I don't like money. Mm. Um, money is a tool. It's one part of a whole. And again, for me, I would ask the question, 
what do I want out of life? I want to live the best life I can. How do I do it? And I got kind of tired of people. I, I guess it each time I would hear someone referred to as a success, mm. it would rub me the wrong way because I'd often think, hang on a second. They would even call me a success, but they would yeah. know. And, and I'd say, why am I a success? Because you've got this portfolio. I'm like, screw that. That's not how you define success. And I, I found myself getting a little bit frustrated by that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. And I would see what I thought of as, and I mean, this might sound kind of, kind of arrogant, but I'd see a lot of blindness. Mm. I'd see a lot of blindness where people would be heading towards building a career at the expense of these other things that truly are meaningful. So they're dropping mm. meaningful things to just add more and more icing on a cake that they already own. Like, why would you need a layer icing more and more icing <laughs> onto, a, onto a fine cake? But that's right. what we end up doing. Forget, right. about, forget about it building five feet of icing on your cake. That's not going to make your cake any better, dude. Right. It's going to make cake worse. So, yeah. Right. It's all about that, you know, like keeping up with the Joneses mentality. <laughs> it's, yeah, but totally. They say like, you know, the more you make, the more you spend kind of thing. Oh, I ain't that the truth. That. Really big part of that. And, you know, when we see someone with a lot of money or we, we know someone who's, you know, who's spending a lot and showing off a lot of stuff, um, we don't love that person anymore because they have a Ferrari or a big house or big income. We don't love or respect them anymore. The only way we can love and respect people is if they in turn love and respect us. So sure. if they're multi-billionaires, um, we will love and respect them if they happen to give us love and respect. And that's it. That's it. So, you know, the idea that we can somehow, um, I can really call this sociological math, mm. where, you know, what we give to other people is what we end up receiving. And the weird thing is, there's a guy, you know, I'll give you this example. There's a guy in there's a condominium um, in Victoria. My, my wife and I have a, a condominium in Victoria, British Columbia. Mm. This guy has got this new, this new, uh, brand new Corvette. And his, <laughs> and his license plate reads, you, R to N D. You are second. Uh. <laughs> How do you tell the world that you're a big prick? Yeah, more than that. So, you, know, you, you gotta go hang. You know, next time you go, next time you're there, you gotta go put a pair of those truck nuts on the bottom. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, he's you know he's a big prick with a little prick driving a Corvette. <laughs> the, the Corvette Man. compensator. Oh, you are second. That's terrible. <laughs> There's, you know, there's, I assume he means it more in a race type because you know, if he's <laughs> blowing he, by you, you're second place in the race. I would hope, it not can, just second place at life. <laughs> <laughs> it probably is, but even that's kind of arrogant, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. So the, you know, there was a there's a town in yeah, a town called Rosetto, Pennsylvania. I don't know if you guys have heard about Rosetto. Yeah. No, I haven't. So now it was it was famous um, for its long the longevity of the people. Mm. They, lived, they lived freakishly long lives and scientists came in and started studying them and they found that like heart disease was virtually non-existent mm -hmm. and you know especially for people who were like below the age of 70 yeah really long time so they, these scientists came in and they're like let's figure this out is it the drinking water they found no because drinking water was the same as these other towns mm -hmm. but like you know does the foods that they ate, did they eat, did they eat better? No, you know, a lot of them smoked and a lot of them ate like sugary foods and so it, wasn't, it wasn't that. And so I like, go, oh, you know, what was it? And they found that it was this incredibly social town. So the social fabric mm. was so, it, what they had done is they had taken a culture that they had in the 1800s in, in Sicily. Um, and they'd maintained that culture where there was an open door, open house policy where people are in out of each other's homes. They're spending so much time together. Um, and they're all these civic community clubs, like so many clubs, wow. organizations for a town that was that small. And they had a sense that for them, if you had money, it was of poor taste to rub it in your neighbor's faces. Mm -hmm. So if you had more money, and you could afford a better car, you know, try to buy the same kind of car everyone else has, because they're going to like that a little bit more. They're going to feel more comfortable with you. Um, you're not going to be standing out. People aren't going to love you anymore. Imagine thinking about others before yourself. 
<laughs> if there's ever the, anything more un-American than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the irony of that, though. In doing so, you actually benefit yourself. Right. Sure. Right? So and that, that's key. And so what happened, though, is in the 80s, when a lot of the younger people in Rosetto started to get sense of the American dream, they decided, well, they're going to build a bigger house outside mm. of that, that tight social fabric. They're going to buy a better car. They've got higher level of income. Today, the people in Rosetto don't live any longer than they do in a typical American town. Wow. Oh, wow. So they ended. That's terrible. They've mm. been poisoned. Yeah, I saw recently there's a place in Italy, I forgot where exactly, but they have the highest concentration of centennials in the world people that live over 100 years old um and that that social aspect you talk about was one of the reasons why like they have a, a just a massive community there of people and they have one of the lowest divorce rates in the world too which is incredible so yeah yeah i believe that's sardinia i think yeah it might have been that yeah good stuff oh, that's incredible so I can't uh, imagine that so just just positive relationships is enough to yeah, make you live longer there's a guy yeah. named dan bootner and he started studying what they call blue zones. So there are mm. these regions of the world where people live freakishly long time. And they, you know, they, they looked and figured at first, is it the diet? Is it the exercise? No, that stuff was all over the map in terms of what people ate. Some were mm -hmm. vegetarian, some were carnivores, some, some smoked a lot. And, you know, like there was all of these different, these different uh, variables, all these differences. But what they found was the, the common variable was their they were freakishly social, like tight, tight. Like wow. the community was like a family mm -hmm. and it was just so much love there. And this is one, one of the reasons, of course, where you know, the pandemic hit us all so hard because the thing we craved the most was taken away from us. That's right. that connection that, we, that we, we need to have with other people, which is probably why more than ever, when I talked about setting goals that are relationship-based goals, and, and truly putting those as a priority over stuff that we buy or money that we're spending on, um, on these other material things uh, mm. is so important. That's mm. terrific. That's fascinating. Well, Andrew, I got to say, you are definitely a breath of fresh air. So, you know, it's funny you talked about like that, the prejudice that you get from having that portfolio. And, you know, I was very excited to have you on, but I thought you were going to be just kind of a typical Wall Street kind of stockbroker guy. One of the things we try not to do is do a ton of research because we yeah. want to ask those questions. We we want to be those two dumb dudes. We want you to teach us. We don't want to learn before you come on. You just definitely the complete opposite of what I expected, but in the best way possible. I really appreciate you coming on. Like this, this was amazing. Um, do you want to tell everybody where we can find your books before you go? If you got anything else you want to social. Plug? social media links, any of that stuff? Yeah, thanks for asking. I, I have a website at andrewhallam.com. And so you can find links to my book Balance there. And it's available uh, on all online bookstores and, and should be available at brick and mortar bookstores as well after January the 18th. So yeah, I, I appreciate you, you asking that. And, you know, it was kind of fun with this with you guys because what we did was, you know, it was recording as soon as I as soon as I got oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> in the we, beginning we scare a lot of was, people with that you know <laughs> that's, that's awesome like in the beginning you know i'm giving some background and i'm just talking and then i'm realizing sure. no we're doing it now like this yeah. is all you yeah. know because anything anything we don't like uh, you just cut it out and then but sometimes even we found that sometimes just like the pre-talk it has some of the best content so we just said you know what let's just record right off the bat and just chop out whatever we don't want to we don't want to keep we also we also record like a nice intro like to introduce you and what you've done and things like that as well afterwards uh so when the episode does go live it's not just like hey here's some random dude we're talking <laughs> yeah, <right>. to <laughs> uh, you guys have interviewed some really interesting people um so well, I've, I've, I've listened to some of them the, the one um the latest one about that woman who was uh 3.7 years sober and Catherine. yeah yeah Catherine. And, that was really fascinating this uh you know this weightlifting world record that she had for picking up that finite thing right the like, cube yeah the yeah. cube is so uh, crazy the, the grip strength yeah the grip that's right that was awesome yeah, yeah, so yeah. you guys are doing some like cool stuff baby. yeah thank you thank cool, you yeah, i appreciate we're, that yeah. we're, we're really excited about it the whole teach you dumb dudes thing really is just because we just want to hear different things and learn different things neither bento or i joe or i are 
big travelers, right? And so for us, it was like, well, how can we experience as much as possible? And that's what we said, let's just talk to as many people as we can about what they do and see what they can teach us. And so it's been, it's been really fun so far. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. I love that outlook. I love that outlook. And I, like, uh, I was just thinking, you know, as I'm, I'm booking things, radio shows and podcasts. Oh, I'm sure you're a busy guy, huh? You must get some big, some big asks, right? Yeah. And, and so it's fun because, um, like I've got like, you know, some people are starting out and then I've got some, some really, really, really big ones, big national sure. ones and such. But I just love, um, I love the connecting with the people and, and shooting the breeze and talking to them. Right. Of I, course. And, and my thing is, it's funny because my natural inclination is actually not to be, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm your guest, but my natural inclination, like if you met me on the street, I'm the guy who's going to ask you a gazillion questions before you find out <laughs> anything about me because I'm not, in, I'm not interested in my story. Yeah, like, right. <laughs> my story is I get my story. I'm not that interested in it. I'm interested in your story. Mm. Yeah, it's, absolutely. See, and I'm the guy on the street that's like, why is this guy talking to me, asking me all these questions? <laughs> <laughs> like, get away from me. <laughs> well, well, Andrew, and well, th- thanks again, man. Thanks for joining us. And I uh, you know, hope you had fun. We definitely appreciate you coming on teaching us some, some good stuff about investment and also uh, balance and setting those social goals. I got to work on that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll get those adoption papers over to you after this call. <laughs> we'll do that. No problem. No get them all problem. Pre- pre-signed, ready to go for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I'll share this. You guys send me the link and then, and I'll share it too. So it'll bring, it'll bring some traffic to you guys as well. Thank Beautiful. you. We always do appreciate that, Andrew. Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure. Pleasure. All right. Yeah, Take care, Andrew. Yeah, you too. Bye bye. It's not good. Oh yeah. You hear that? I sure did. Yeah, that was a good one. Oh, God, we have Burger King. My stomach is rocking.